Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. <laughs> My name is Wolfgang Knöbel, I'm the director of this institute. And for me, it is a great pleasure and also a great honor to say a few words on the occasion of this evening lecture by Jack Katz, who is one of the most influential ethnographers, criminologists, and sociologists, who wrote already classical texts and books such as How Emotions Work or Seductions of Crime, which currently play an enormous role in our research group on macroviolence here at the Hamburg Institute. I also have a very personal memory related to his work. In 1991, I started as a researcher at the John F. Kennedy Institute for North American Studies at the Free University of Berlin. And in that very year, a book came out, edited by Alan Wolf, America at Century's End. And this was a book, obligatory reading for every American studies scholar at that time. It was a volume with many articles on different aspects and problems of American society. And among these many very good articles, one paper immediately caught my attention, a brilliant article, but also, that's what I thought at least at that time, a very odd one. Even the title was odd. I thought, Criminals' Passions and Their Progressive Dilemma. The article, of course, was written by Jack Katz. And for German ears and eyes at that time, the things he told were all, all somewhat strange, I thought. He talked about the materialist bias of criminology and not about the socioeconomic roots of violent behavior. He talked about the creativity of violence and not about the societal problem of violence. He emphasized interpersonal dynamics and not psychological or sociological background conditions. And he talked about the powerful attractions of sneaky thrills, about seductive play, about the temptation of desecration, etc. I was excited by reading this stuff, but I have also to admit I never understood at that time how new and original such an approach was. Only many years later, when the so-called new sociology of violence in Germany started, that was in the late 1990s, I realized that all this was already in this odd and seemingly strange article by Jack Katz. An article that still is as exciting today when you read it as it was almost 30 years ago. So I'm very happy that he is with us tonight and that he is introduced by Dr. Nadia Maurer, member of the research group on macroviolence here at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. So, I will leave it with a rather brief introduction now. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear colleagues, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the Hamburg Institute for Social Research tonight. My name is Nadia Maurer, as Wolfgang Knubel just mentioned. I'm an anthropologist and I work here at the Institute as a researcher. Within my research project, I focus on violence in peace processes. That is, the simultaneous end of violence, relocation, sequels, and perpetuations of violence in the course of major societal change. So I'm very delighted to welcome Jack Katz tonight. Jack Katz is Professor Emeritus at the University of California in Los Angeles. Academically, uh, Jack Katz prefers to inhabit the nexus of criminology, sociology, and ethnography. Given the decades of intellectual curiosity, activity, and productivity, and numerous texts, and, and uh, since speaking time is reserved for Jack, I cannot give a comprehensible introduction into his diverse and manifold work here. Therefore, I limit myself to outlining in a few sentences and sketches what distinguishes his work, what makes it worth reading, and what makes it very special. Well, the special thing about Jack's work is that he always actually refers to very concrete objects, be it petty crimes, be it specific phenomena such as school shootings, a riot, or angry drivers. But he does not lose himself in the concrete but opens up wider and unusual contexts. So 
Hence, some summary and eclectic points that I think are some of the ingredients of his way of seeking insights, I think. Number one, by f always slightly shifting the framing of his questions, Jack comes up with highly instructive insights. One example in one chapter, namely pissed off in LA, he shows how, how drivers frequently get angry and respond in absurd ways, such as yelling at, uh, at other drivers over great distances, seeking revenge through um, risky maneuvers that do not seem worth the effort only moments later, and using obscene gestures to drivers who cut them off. Well, witnessing such a phenomenon could lead to most different inquiries. You could look at urban planning failures. You could also look at time compression in people's everyday, uh, everyday lives. You could look at professional workers' work-life balance, and so on and so forth. Or you can look at emotions. That's what Jack does. In respect to the drivers, he concluded, all differences in, I quote, all differences in income, prestige, social power, and respectability are washed out on these egalitarian roads. Number two, Jack's research strategy in terms of method triangulation can be summarized roughly as whatever works. Everything that is useful will do. A mix of statistics, ethnographic data, newspaper coverage, and social psychology with a good pinch of common sense and intuition. Number three, Jack has a talent for naming blind spots, puzzles, and gaps. But why? I mean, presumably, he does not have blinkers on and has successfully refused mind cuffs. Um, fourth, in his writing, Jack is using, make, makes uh, often use of metaphors to shed light on various crime phenomena for his readers. Thereby, he consistently adopts the actor's perspective, their emotional worlds, their interests, the situations they find themselves in, and their interpretations of the world. Very pointed, very thick, and at the same time hilarious to read, so that sometimes you have that moment of recognition, you laugh out loud and think, and notice, yep, that's exactly how things are. Um, so in sum, this is a clear recommendation to read Jack Katz's works, which brings me to the next point. This is a good moment for an advertising break. <laughs> Um, Jack has contributed a couple of years ago, I think in 2015, a chapter translated in German in uh, Axel Pauls and Benjamin Schwalb's anthology, Gewaltmassen. Um, it was published here in our publishing house, the Hamburger Edition. Okay. End of Edward. <laughs> I'm particularly um, curious about Jack's lecture today, also because violence, that's what Wolfgang Knubel just uh, mentioned has always been a focus of research at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. A current task of violence research is that the bandwagon seems to be stuck in a theoretical cul-de-sac in some respects. The current agenda focuses strongly on situations and interactions at the micro level between individuals, between groups, between per perpetrators and victims, or within groups. What has slightly slipped out of sight, on the other hand, however, are the wider social processes at the larger level. The fact that crime had risen rapidly over um, a longer period of time and then has fallen even further over a period of five decades and throughout the USA calls for explanations. And this is precisely what Jack will be talking about tonight. One last remark. Um, with regard to the pr uh, procedure, before I give way, uh, the course of the evening is as follows. Jack will speak for about one hour. Um, you will then all have the opportunity to ask questions. Around 8.30, the formal part of the lecture and Q&A will be over. And afterwards, we invite all of you um, to let the evening and the lecture pass with a glass of wine on the ground floor. Now, I would like to give the floor to Jack Katz. We look forward to hearing your, your lecture. Okay, here you are. Uh, pardon me for speaking in English. Uh, <laughs> if I spoke in German, 
neither of us would understand anything uh, going on. And uh, I do appreciate the openness to the limitations of the typical American scholar. Uh, thank you so much for those introductions, Wolfgang and Nadia. Uh, there's an American phrase that goes, uh, you should quit when you're ahead, which means if things are going well, it's time to leave before they start going bad. And that's kind of what I feel now. So for the introductions were so gracious. Uh, and I appreciate the recollection of that article from uh, some time ago, which had kind of gone out of, uh, gone out of my mind. But, uh, and, and Nadia, thank you for the summary of, of some of the high points. I appreciate that. Uh, and thanks for the Institute. Uh, I'm going to be, in one part, very critical of how, at least in the US, and indeed in Europe, most researchers study crime at least those who try to explain the rise and fall of crime over long historical periods. Uh, and that critical perspective leads me to have some hope in independent research institutes that are a bit free from direct university control that something is very wrong with the way crime is typically studied. And What's most wrong is that the university researchers don't acknowledge the problem. So briefly, uh, in the 1960s, crime started to rise in the US, in Canada, and in some parts of Western Europe, and rose to rates that were unprecedented according to at least the most reliable data. Uh, in the U.S., murder went from something like four per 100,000, which was already four times the Western European rate, to perhaps 10, in some places like Detroit, 30 per 100,000 by the early 1990s. And then there was uh, a decline started so that uh, now we're down to, in places like New York, European rates, like one per 100,000, lower than the US has been in major cities in 50, 60 years. And that means thousands and thousands of lives saved, huge amounts of medical miseries avoided, vast expenses. But even more directly, it reflects a change in the whole texture of the city the cities that uh, I think not enough academics live in in the US. Unfortunately, the US has planted research universities in the countryside. People who have lived in the universities that are in the center of the city have seen this and witnessed this, and it's, it would be very hard to deny. And in fact, they've seen these changes happen 10 years or so before the criminologists did. They saw them in everyday life. They saw that chaos, the danger, the dread, tensions on the street had passed. Now, by 1990, after about 25 years of dramatic rises and the political attention that the politicians gave to it as they tried to exploit the crime rates for their purposes, after this long period of time, uh, criminologists were giving up the explanations they had for why crime occurs, why it would rise. For example, uh, the typical economic explanation that bad economy, high unemployment, uh, because unemployment had not been going up. They also had an explanation, a larger number, a larger proportion or a larger number in the youth group that's prone to crime. But that didn't fit with the facts when crime was going up. Uh, but nobody put out the white flag to wave surrender and give up those theories. In in instead, they just stopped arguing them. There were a couple of mea culpas, but uh, very few. Then in uh, the early 1990s, crime started to go down. It took about 10 years before criminologists started to, started to acknowledge that crime was significantly down and that now we need a whole new era of research. Uh, as I'll start to point out, the way they started to explain the decline of crime continued the, uh, 
problems with the way research had been done. In short, after about 50, 60 years of these very dramatic rises and falls of crime, which are also rises and falls of a whole host of related social problems. So this isn't just an issue for criminologists. It's for anybody studying the texture of the cities or social problems in general. Uh, social science that cannot offer much of value, that seems to be off in the wrong direction when these vast changes are occurring, and yet which commands more and more resources at universities, more and more faculties, more and more research support, and, does, and can offer nothing convincing for all of this, should, you would think, start to question itself very seriously. And yet there's been, while there have been some internal criticism, very little fundamental questioning. Uh, so I'm going to try to point out some of the problems with the way research is done. Then I will try to give an understanding of why crime went up and why it went down in, through social processes that criminological research can't get at, systematically cannot get at. And so it's a, so it's a call for... Of course, I, it's a call for my understanding that I'll put forth, but even more importantly, and maybe more convincingly, a call for rethinking some of the basic ways we try to understand the rise and fall of crime. Uh, in the end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that we shouldn't be studying crime per se. The thing we should try to be studying is the rise and fall of chaos in urban social life. Whole areas of the city become chaotic, and crime is an offshoot of that. We shouldn't take crime per se as our objective, but studying these areas of chaos. Uh, and second, we should be looking at social processes that create turning points. And in the early 1990s, when crime rates had been going up and then started to decline, you could say that was a turning point. There, there's nothing in the way criminal, criminological research is done that enables us to understand turning points. And yet turning points are a phenomenon in many, many ma major important, uh, significant uh, parts of social life. I, can't, I was just in Holland and thinking about the tulip craze from the 18th century, I believe. And that is a symbol of the sorts of turning points that happen, and for some of the same reasons, actually, some of the same market reasons. We need a social science that can understand turning points and how they happen. And third, we need to understand uh, crime rates and urban sociology, how cities change within an international uh, perspective, which seems obvious to perhaps most of you. But it is not obvious when you read the literature uh, that tries to explain crime and other social problems for one very fundamental reason. The researchers use national data sets. Those national data sets don't give them access to the lives of people who are coming from other countries and either going back or coming and staying. And that there's a, an artificial bounding, an artificial nationalism in the, the way uh, the research data is uh, is set up that is very tempting for criminologists to use. Let, let me give you a couple of examples of the kinds of problems uh, that I find in the way criminological research is done. So just to give you a taste of, because I can't assume most of you have read the explanations that have been given for the rise and fall of crime. So this will be also a way of trying to give you a little feel of that. Uh, there was an explanation uh, that abortion, when it became legal in the US in the early 1970s, led to a decline of crime about 18, 20 years later, when the unwanted children were not born. So they did not become, and this is a couple of economists came up with this. Uh, the kind of, now, over time, the, this theory has been criticized a lot, and it's not very convincing to most criminologists. But the stunning aspect of this is the kind of explanation it is. It's what I would call 
a Hail Mary pass. In American football, you've got two teams battling, and they're going back and forth, and they're trying to score points. And often, at near the end of the game, the game ends after an hour. So in the 58th minute, it's a tied score, and the quarterback on one team has control of the ball, and he has no way, he sees no way of winning, so he just throws the ball out over everybody's head, and somebody else on his team near the end zone grabs it, crosses, six points, they win. This is the kind of argument that the abortion research was. You take the quarterback, one of the economists is standing with abortion in 1970, and he throws out, and the other one grabs it in, uh, 20 years later, and what they do is they jump over all the intermediating processes. So in order for abortion to reduce unwanted children, it has to be that the people in that part of the population who would have produced those uncared for children are the ones who abort. But they don't study that. There's no need to study that. That's for all the plebeians on the playing field to look at. Well, when people started to study that, they found that, well, it's upper middle class women who were the most using abortion, not the poor, the poor women. They also didn't seem to realize, the economists, that the people had discovered sex and the results of sex before the economists had. So that about 20 years earlier, in the US and in Western Europe, new forms of birth control became available the pill, uh, and in the US it was illegal to use contraception until the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional to ban contraception. So in the 1960s you had a, an earlier instance where uh, women were given more control over reproduction. So you should have seen 20 years later a reduction in crime, but instead 20 years later is when the crime starts to shoot up. So what we, part of the lesson is we need to follow the social problems process step by step between the cause that we offer and the result uh, that we, that we uh, propose. I, another metaphor I like to use to indicate some of the weaknesses in how crime research is done is uh, the cyclops. The cyclops, one eye, Several different ways criminological research seems to be the knowledge of a cyclops. When crime started to decline, 10 years later, a number of books come out to explain the decline of crime. And their arguments are more or less compatible with the evidence. Um, increased incarceration in the US. Um, a, some, a better economy, expanding economy. Uh, the demographics, the youth group that would be prone to crime getting smaller. So all of this fits. But the very same factors were happening from 1965 to 1990 when crime was going up. It was an expanding an economy. In the 1980s when crime reached its heights, unemployment went from 10 to 5% in the US. So this is one directional vision. Let's just take the part of the curve that our explanations fit with, let's ignore the other part. And a whole little industry has developed of different researchers putting out explanations that just look at this part and don't try to reconcile it with. So that's one way it's a kind of cyclops. The other is cyclops, lives on an island. Cyclopses, I guess, live on an island. And uh, I'm thinking of uh, the Odyssey and uh, Odysseus coming to the island. And the island, they're rare visitors to this island. And the Cyclops is irritated by their arrival. Uh, Most criminologists, almost all, while occasionally they acknowledge immigration has some role in it, they think they're talking about the same population over time. They think that that population, 
that's being exposed to higher or lower unemployment, uh, higher imprisonment rates, uh, the ability to abort, is that same population. And so it's the change in the outcomes, the rates, reflect the change in the behavior of that population. But what's happening over this period of time, from 1965 to 2010 or to the current day, is a tremendous transformation of the population in the major cities of the US. Today, by the year 2000, in New York and Los Angeles, two-thirds of the population was either first or second generation immigrant. At the start, in 1960, 90% of those populations were native born. Immigration had stopped around the end of the Second World War in the US. And so it made sense for 50 years to write your explanations, think of social problems and explanations as if you're on an island with a set population that's being affected by different pressures over time. But what started to happen after 1965 is immigration started to pick up and then it picked up rapidly and it became so powerful that you had a fundamental transformation. This is not a minor matter. Well, think of an explanation like abortion. What the economists are thinking when they propose that explanation. The 18 year olds or the youth group that is the quote, at risk group for committing crime, many of those people weren't born in the country or their parents weren't in the US when they were conceived. There's no acknowledgement of the kind of intellectual and research problems required when you really consider a population as a constant flow. You have more like a river-like view of what the city is. You know, the cities are usually built on the banks of rivers as, as here and, and almost all cities in the world, but there are also flows of people through and there was an artificial period in the 20th century when the flows stopped in the US. Social science grew up during that period. It grew up with a notion that they have a little model on an island and they don't have to deal with flow. So that's a second. Uh, a third problem that the Cyclops metaphor appeals to me is the Cyclops is very tall and the way the Ulysses escapes is that he clothes his men in goat skins and he's at the feet of the Cyclops and they don't, they don't realize it until it's too late until his men are, they've escaped and then they attack. Uh, conventional ways of doing criminological research have no ability to appreciate turning points. Turning points are what's milling around at your feet, like Ulysses' men running around the feet of the Cyclops until it's ready to appear. And what I'll be arguing is that for about 25 years, cities were changing from 1965 to 1990. As things were getting worse, this, in effect, the seeds were sown, the changes were put into process for a turning point, which didn't get to the surface until the 1990s. And then, and progressively, it's been obvious that it's a different city, there's different phenomenon going on. But we should expect as researchers that changes are, when things look the worst, that's opportunity for some people to come in, especially in a city, because land gets cheap, new ideas start, new people come in with new perspectives. It takes them a while to get traction, to build up. We shouldn't expect to see the results right away. Uh, and finally, the, the Cyclops with one eye lacks depth of vision. There, and there's a certain lack of three-dimensionality in the typical perspective of criminology. And one example that'll be very relevant for understanding the rise and the fall of crime is the organization of drug markets. Drug markets are usually understood, uh, there's a certain number of users, there's a price of drugs, certain number of users, and there's a crime rate. And those things are related. Without any appreciation that what drug markets, uh, how they develop over time is that there are first users, almost like in any fad there's a first user. Then there are second wave users. Then there are third wave users. And they're not the same people. 
and they don't get involved for the same reasons, and they don't have the same uh, size or relationship to each other. So the, in, in a way, much of the decline in violence related to drug tra trafficking is a change in the market, a layering. You need a kind of a three-dimensional, a more depth of vision, in a sense. Uh, okay, I won't go on with the critique of, of criminology, uh, but I'll get to my understanding of the rise and fall of crime, and it's going to sound different, I believe, than other things you may have heard. Uh, and actually, I came to this not... I got a big grant to study crime from the U.S. government, and I got some graduate students, and we started to do research, and I thought I was doing urban sociology and that I was cheating the government because I, was, I didn't see the relevance for crime. And it's only recently now, thank you for the invitation, that now I see that what I was doing in studying urban sociology was actually the way to study crime. So it's, and this, by the way, is the blessing and the dilemma of the ethnographer. You don't really know what you're studying until you're way, way into it. And you, almost, you always think that you're lying to the people funding you. <laughs> Even though in your heart you think you're sincere, but you don't understand. So this is also you know, a justification for all those depressed ethnographers out there who think <laughs> that they're cheats. Uh, OK. Explaining the rise and fall. OK, on the rise, the critical factor at the macro social level has been what reluctantly, personally, I came to think of, because I've never been attuned to these, uh, this kind of explanation, but the data made me see it as the loss of charisma of the center. That in the 1960s, all levels of government all of a sudden could no longer do things that they'd been, do, been able to do for decades. There was a loss of authority. A lot of the politicized debates about the 60s are about the protesters and the right and the left. It's not, a, it's not a story of the right and left. It's really a story about, in retrospect, the artificial accretion of power to the centers of government authority in the middle of the 20th century. In the 1930s, in the Depression, and then in the Second World War, government authorities were given powers they never had before. It took about 20 years after the Second World War for those powers to start to erode. And without anybody in control and without anybody saying game over, uh, in a sense, charisma or deference to central authority as somehow unquestionable and, and worthy of respect started to fall apart. And that led, and the way I got to this is not by thinking about central authority, charisma, or history, but thinking about the pockets of chaos that emerged in the city and then tracing where those came from. So, uh, start with the whole, and the area of LA I studied uh, intensively was Hollywood. And Hollywood, well, you think of the stars, has a lot of poor people, it's majority Latino immigrant. And it has, a very, it has had a very high crime rate. When crime rates were at its height, Hollywood was right up there. So uh, it's not the entertainment show business Hollywood we're talking about, but it's residential Hollywood. So there's one, there was one pocket where there was a lot of homelessness with open street drug markets, high murder rates, high robbery rates. And so I was trying to understand where did that come from? Well, one of the... Uh, the ways homelessness developed was a removal of the authority of the, the police, the county, and the state, one after the other, in removing the homeless, which they'd been doing for decades. The police in Los Angeles would find a homeless person, uh, and they would just, they would arrest them. Somebody out on the street at midnight in Los Angeles could be arrested, actually no matter how respectful, send, uh, there, there were a lot of uh, European actors who came to Hollywood and were walking around after dinner and they'd get arrested and find themselves in, in jail. Uh, 
Well, the police would take the, the homeless and they would transport them to a camp out at the edge of the county. They had no le legal authority to hold them there because they hadn't committed any crime, so then they drift back into the city. They picked them up again and they put them out. This had gone on for decades. In the 1960s, the court said that's unconstitutional. So that stops. At about that time, forces start from the left and the right, and under Ronald Reagan, they end the state mental hospitals that power to incarcerate people against their will, even if they're not harmless to others. So people who previously had been confined in state mental hospitals now are drifting out in society. And this is a merger of the right and the left. The civil rights leadership, an African-American leader, actually from LA, and Ronald Reagan agree to do this. Reagan to save money, and maybe out of libertarian ideas, and the, the civil rights and the African American, because this is especially oppressive to Af African Americans. A third level, uh, the youth on the streets would be picked up and put against their will in a home with delinquents, and also children whose parents had died in car accidents, foster ch children looking for foster homes and they'd be held there. This was declared uh, unconstitutional. So there's nobody in charge. There's no, uh, there's no one authority saying, let's change all these rules. It's happening in separate decisions. And the result is, though, homelessness starts. And with homelessness comes, homeless congregations always have high levels of violence. So that one, that's one of the pockets of violence. They're vulnerable people. And there are also often a disproportionate number of mentally deranged people who attack. So that's one of the pockets of violence that emerges as, in a sense, without a national debate, a national decision to remove these government authorities, they, they're pulled away. Uh, a second area, um, pornography. Oh, let me, let me say that what happens, and this is the layered phenomenon, when the homeless start drifting, they're no longer taken off the streets, there are institutions existing that had been in place for 100 years. Salvation Army, Traveler's Aids, and a whole series of churches that were created at the turn of the 20th century. And they were not created to help the homeless, but now they're there, and in a sense, they, become, they institutionalize the location of the homeless in a certain area by providing services. And you'll see this again and again in, in what I'm going to be, be describing, that there's this interaction between pre-existing institutions that are not there to deal with crime and crime-related things, and new social movements, new so populations coming in, and they interact to kind of stabilize or anchor Anchors of chaos. So the second example is uh, the triple X, XXS, the pornography theaters. All of a sudden, they start to appear in the late 60s and 70s. When they appear around them, many of them, there, there's prostitution. And around prostitution, there's drug dealing. And in that intersection of prostitution and drug dealing, there's robberies, there's violence. It's another what I call circles of chaos. I'm, I'm describing the emergence of different circles of chaos in the city. Now, why does, why does pornography start to appear in theaters? The Supreme Court, in fact, never decided pornography is legal. The state prosecutors just stopped bringing the cases to outlaw them. The lawyers presented a lot of objections, and the communities didn't press the prosecutors, so they just gave up. So again, it's not that there's a strong new leadership saying, this is what the US should be. We should have pornography theaters if people want them. It's a good thing. It wasn't a libertarian victory. It wasn't that we elected a libertarian who said, I don't like, the, I think it's bad personally, but if people want to do it, everybody has the right to go to hell in their own way, as one of my professors, uh, Norval Morris, a uh, great criminologist, put it. Um, nobody made the decision. They just stopped making the decisions. Decisions that they've been making, indecency decisions, obscenity decisions, for decades in the US, they just stopped making the decision. 
What's the pre-existing institution? From 1910 to the 1950s, every neighborhood had its own movie theater. The movie producers owned the theaters and they put a movie theater, whether it was Warner Brothers or Paramount or 20th Century Fox, they put a movie theater in every neighborhood. Now these movie theaters no longer had movies to play because people were watching TV. So the pornography shows have an option to come in. They have a place to come in. So this pre-existing institution then gets turned to this purpose and a purpose, this new purpose. And in a sense, you have an anchoring of a new circle of chaos. Now, not every theater went this way, and not every pornography theater had prostitution around it, but many, many did. Uh, Okay, 1965, a new immigration law is passed. This law, after about 45 years, opens up immigration to the U.S. And it was the, the new permission was to uh, family reunification. So if there was somebody in the family here and a mother was outside, or a spouse or a child, okay, you can come in. And then highly skilled people needed for certain special jobs could come in. That was the discussion. Nobody said, let's transform our population. Let's make uh, New York and LA and after them, San Francisco and, well, not San Francisco for various reasons, but the major cities in the US, let's make them majority immigrant cities. Let's transform the whole demographic complexion of the US. Nobody made that decision. What happened is that immigrants started to come up in family reunification and then they started to, more and more people started to come up and there was what's called chain migration where one comes up and brought others up and there was simply no ability to make uh, a new immigration policy in the US and there still isn't. We're still struggling with that. Nobody can make a clear decision so we have this all, today's version of the, of the crisis is at least a recognition of the crisis, but for 30 years as the population changed, there was no acknowledgement that a, a new law had been set in place to transform. Now, immigrants are not criminals. In fact, I'm gonna be arguing that the reason crime went down is that immigrants replaced more crime-prone groups but initially, in the first wave of immigration, immigrants are vulnerable. They're vulnerable to other immigrants and they're vulnerable to native people as, as vulnerable people and especially immigration to the US by people who didn't have legal authorization. So they'd be very hesitant to go to the police. It took a, about 20 years for the authorities to start to realize the dilemma and try to get protection to the immigrants and that helped uh, that became part of the... Uh... Other, other uh, factors, cocaine started to come into the U.S. without any effective control. It seemed to surprise the authorities. The authorities were all geared on heroin at, coming out of Afghanistan and other places. Then heroin started to come out of Latin America and they played catch up for about 20 years before they could get law enforcement mobilized. Uh, uh, and then, uh, interesting, another way that central authority was uh, stymied, each of the states, the federal government in each of the states had been building highways whenever they wanted to. From before the war, then there was a pause during the Second World War, and then after the war, the highway, federal highway plan went into high gear, and in all the states, the state governments authorized highways. In 1965, and this is a, a magic year, it's the year of the Watts riots, which is what everybody focuses on, like the civil disorder. And they think that was the, that was the source of the chaos. That was part of a larger process. The Watts riots were in the African American area of LA. There was a, a protest against police action and then burnings and lootings. Uh, was part of a larger process of a, of a frustration of a resistance to state authority. And 
in Los Angeles, as in almost all the other cities in the US, and as in Gothenburg, and as in Paris, and, and maybe there's local examples in, in Hamburg, I don't know, but uh, there were local protests that stopped highway plans for the first time ever. For the first time ever, the California Highway Authority was frustrated in a plan to build highways through the center of LA. And the protest didn't come out of Watts, it came out of Beverly Hills. People in Beverly Hills were offended that the highway was gonna come through the neighborhood. And in New York, Jane Jacobs led, led that's perhaps more famous, led the, a protest in, in about this time, 1965, against the highway extension that would have wiped out Greenwich Village. So that's, they stopped government authority. Now, Reagan, actually was, wasn't talking to the highway people saying, I'm against this, he was for that. It just shows the lack of coordination, that there really is a lack of leadership. There's just a, a resistance now that's successful at all levels of government. The consequence is that a lot of the land in the city that had been cleared out for highway building was now, in effect, dead land. It was useless land. It was very unattractive land. It had been partly dug out. Houses had been bought up and in anticipation of building the highway. But now the houses didn't have to be destroyed because they weren't going to build the highway. So this is, these are some of the areas that the immigrants come in now. You have a convergence. Immigrants are coming up principally in LA from Mexico and then from Central America later. And they're looking for inexpensive places to stay so they form, and these become, even though most of the immigrants are law-abiding, this is a new flood of poor people in, and you get heightened crime rates initially, in any case, in these areas. So it's another circle of chaos, in effect, that grows out of this loss of authority of the center. And so you, you get multiple different circles of chaos. And, um, I may not have time to go over all the studies, but the ethnography studies that best show this are studies of different circles of chaos. The authors are not kind of thinking about the other circles. They're just thinking about where they're studying. But uh, one of them, for example, is in public housing. So Sotir Venkatesh has a great study of a public housing uh, project in Chicago that, uh, where there's very high crime. That's one of the circles of chaos. Alice Goffman has a study in Philadelphia of another circle of chaos uh, around some families that are very disorganized and the sons related to other friends are doing a lot of crime and they're on the run. And on the run is almost the definition of chaos, of what I mean by chaos, that on an everyday life, people, the young men don't know whether the police are coming from them or somebody who they owe money is coming for them or the, the girlfriend who uh, they abandoned to go with another girl has put somebody uh, against them and, or somebody they've offended is, is coming after them to shoot them. This is the kind of on the run, this kind of everyday, kind of vividly chaotic life. Uh, another circle of chaos around <coughs> pornography. Uh, another circle of chaos around street drug markets. Another around crack houses another around some schools that are in gang neighborhoods, another around parks that are used by uh, gangs as hangouts. There's a whole network of urban parks. They were put in as part of the America Beautiful movement at, at the turn of the 20th century to make America like a leafy suburb, even in the cities. And these become gang hangouts now, and they become a new circle of chaos. Um, well, I, I'm going to jump over a detailed discussion of how these circles of chaos lead to violence, but the main point is it's the everyday kind of uh, chaotic interaction in these worlds that from time to time sporadically and almost unpredictably produces acts of violence, and that's what makes for our high crime rates. Uh, to take one example out of Venkatesh's study in public housing, uh, there's a gang that wants to control the drug dealing in public housing to get the cooperation of the people living there. The gang helps tenants control, basically the tenants take over the public property and they make other tenants pay them to get a refrigerator, for example, or to actually get into building apartments they have the right to. 
then other tenants are prostitutes, and then others are, in effect, uh, extorting money. And the gangs are kind of working with the police, who are getting paid, to allow this to go on as long as it doesn't get out of control. And from time to time, it does get out of control. And there are different personal uh, misunderstandings, fears, revenges, and that leads to sporadic violence. And so, but to understand, if you just look at the acts of violence, you're going to miss the real causal uh, grounds, the fer fertile causal grounds that produces the act of violence. And unfortunately, criminology takes the acts because they take, that's what the police have to focus on. The police aren't sociologists. The police are there to make criminal cases, to get evidence on criminal cases uh, against particular individuals. So you don't see the, the circles of violence when you use police data. Um, another very, very powerful writing on uh, the circles of violence comes out of Eli Anderson's work, uh, Code of the Street. And I just came from Amsterdam and I was working with Marie Lindegaard who did a fabulous study in Cape Town where for the guys she was studying, the murder rate was almost 500 per 100,000. That's five per thousand. And that's every year. So every year you're in this at-risk group, that's, that's your risk, five out of a thousand, for this demographic. And she finds the same thing that Eli Anderson does, that in, in neighborhoods where there's uh, a code of the street, it means you have to walk on the street in a certain way to show that you're not vulnerable to get attacked. But if you don't do the inflection the right way, you send the message that you're going to attack somebody. And then they have to attack you so they don't get attacked. And so it's a very fine line. And uh, this is a kind of culture that the ethnographers can write about almost too well. That is to say, they can almost uh, portray it as an art that you can learn to master. But it's an art that has tremendous risks of misunderstanding. If you hold a gaze with somebody too long, that's defiant and so, but you have to see where they are so that you don't bump into them. So you show respect, so you have to look but not look too much. Now, how do you do that every day without sometimes having a misunderstanding? And Lindegaard uh, documents a lot of the misunderstandings that lead to brutal acts, homicidal acts. So it's the code of the street. This kind of creates a kind of daily circle of violence in public space. Uh, well, then what happens when crime declines? Uh, lots of di di different dis di dispersed, unconnected activities in different areas. Uh, one of the ones that kind of illustrates, not the most powerful, but it's one of the best illustrations. In LA and other US cities, different neighborhoods get defined as historic, officially historic. Previously to the 1970s, historic, designa historic designation was only for institutional buildings, like town hall, churches. Now neighborhoods are getting designated. Turns out that when you look at where those started, they started right on the edge of high crime areas. The people living there first got organized not in honor of history, but to fight crime. In the course of fighting crime, they realized there's federal money and legal protection if you call your area historic. And because the city had been so unattractive for new development for so many decades, a lot of buildings were in original state. Because in the move to the suburbs that had been going, going on for 50 years, cities had been abandoned, so they designate historic. So all of a sudden you have like a network of historic neighborhoods popping up initially right on the edge of high crime areas. Later on, 20 years later, the affluent areas realize they can get a tax deduction for this from the government, so they jump in. So if you look at it now and you don't see the historic layering, you don't appreciate that historic neighborhoods in US cities were crime-fighting devices. Uh, 
uh, over 20 years, the agency serving the homeless gradually professionalized. Uh, early on, actually, one of my students, Maggie Kusenbach, who uh, came to study with us in LA from Germany, uh, was doing ethnography in a homeless facility where in the early raw days when the staff was like dealing drugs with the, the homeless kids. They were scandalized and scandalous, but over 20 years, careers started to develop so that to get a job running a homeless center, it was possible to hire somebody who'd had a job running another homeless center. You couldn't do that for 20 years because nobody had the experience. This is a new institution. So now you start to get professionalization. It takes a generation. Then they start to interlace, and they start to control the homeless youth. They start to keep them out of the way of the business people so the business people don't complain. And they start to cooperate with the police so the police aren't arresting the homeless and aren't hassling them. They're guiding them to the the homeless center. So the police come like a social welfare agency. And you start to get a control of crime. Um, the same time, the immigrants uh, start to develop more stable ties. And they work out relations with the police. So in the 1970s, the LA police came out with a policy long before the current debates in the US. They came out with a policy that they will not report immigration status to the immigration authorities to get to cultivate trust from the immigrants. And they start to get more control over the chaos going on on the streets. They start to get more cooperation. Uh, many other things happened that simultaneous. Uh, DVDs came in, and then streaming pornography. So all the X, triple X theaters went out of business. Nobody needed to go to them anymore. Uh, it's not just these uh, grassroots changes occurring, other changes occurring. But uh, the second major factor of changes internationally, and I, I'll point to two. One is that immigration builds rapidly in the 1970s and then very rapidly in the 1980s. By the 1990s, you've got a bulk of the immigrant population that has 15 to 20 years in their US destination. They're not so green as, as uh, migrants from rural areas to the city used to be called. They're not so vulnerable. They have more contacts. They have more street smarts. They have more connections with each other. They have more connections with institutions. So they become increasingly stabilizing. But as the population, the immigration population mounts to become the majority of the low income population, both Latin American and even Asian immigrants start to outnumber African American immigrants in the low income population in Los Angeles and in parallel in other numbers in other cities. And what happens is the crime rates start to go down because the immigrants have a much lower crime rate than the native low-income people had had. By a factor of, uh, in the case of Asian poor, it's 10 to 1. The robbery and homicide rates among Asians are one-tenth of what they were before immigration when crime rates started to go up in the 60s and immigration hadn't taken off. And the Latin American immigrants, it's four to five times less than the native robbery rates and homicide rates. So by changing the demographics of poverty, over time you're starting to get a very beneficial effect on, on violence, on street violence, even as the politics starts to tell a different story about the dangerous immigrants. The immigrants actually are the single most powerful reason that crime has gone down in US cities, in particular in New York, which, is, which has enormously diverse migration. Uh, and not all high-skilled people, but low-income people, working-class people, all sorts of people. But their demographics of poverty also shift. In New York, the police take credit <laughs> 
for saying that their policies made the difference, they don't look at the, cha the different perspective that the immigrants have. One of the indicators, finishing high school, goes from something like 50% in, uh, in the late 70s to 90% as you get into the 1990s. So the immigrant youth are filling the schools and they are staying within the structure of the school system. The second international phenomenon that's not picked up is basically a change in the location of violence related to the drug trafficking. Uh, in the 80s, there was great spikes of crime in the cities uh, closely related to young drug dealers in poor areas. That's the same time that Pablo Escobar and the other cocaine uh, cartels are starting to fight it out in Latin America. As those fights proceed in Latin America, they're part of a mass distribution process. They're part of building a new industry. And that's how the drug dealers might see it themselves in their, as they try to defend themselves. But what happens is they're, you're reducing the value. As the, as the mass quantity of drugs starts to come in, the violence builds up in Latin America and it starts to go down in the US, either because drug prices start to fall or because the dealer network expands enormously. The first dealers in the US come out of prison contacts or immigration networks. And this is why you need the layered view. This goes back to the Cyclops, that you need to see the depth. You need to see the layers and how the drug market builds up. Because as cocaine starts to get distributed, then the user starts to become a dealer. And the line between specialized dealers and users fades. And the dealing starts to go on behind private doors. And dealing had always gone on of cocaine behind private doors in the hills of Hollywood without violence. As soon as you get contraband transactions behind private doors, you lose the uh, openness to violence, which is a matter of uh, basically people with a lot of cash being available for victimization as dealers on the street known by others. So you get the, the, the phenomena that Without actually a decline in the taste for heroin it's not, or the demand for heroin, you don't get what some have claimed, that uh, young people learned that it was too dangerous to use uh, crack cocaine or other forms of cocaine. So they, the price of cocaine doesn't show uh, that sort of change. And the, and the drug admissions, I guess that's, that's what they track uh, most effectively on this point. Admissions for drug overdoses don't go down. In fact, they go up. And you have a transformation of the drug problem from out in the streets where there's violence to behind closed doors. In the movement behind closed doors, what you've got is the user-dealer. I buy some heroin for my own use. Where do I get the money? To buy my next purchase, I get it from selling to you. You get it from selling to the next person. So you get like an ex a pyramid scheme almost, like an expanding market. And the market expands enormously. So it's not a decline in the market. It's an expansion of the market and a kind of uh, loss of economic opportunity for specialized drug dealers out in public. So street drug markets disappear. And in one interesting study this uh, Randall Contreras did, uh, he grew up with uh, Dominicans in New York who were into d drug dealing, and he describes the time when it no longer paid to be a drug dealer, and people who had been cocaine dealers now started to rob other cocaine dealers. They shifted from dealing to robbing as the way to, and that, of course, makes it a bit less attractive to be a dealer. So if you study the layering of the market and how it's transforming over time, you can understand how it's starting to go behind <coughs> private walls. And it's not like everybody said no to drugs like Nancy Reagan wanted. It's not a change in taste. It's a, ch it's a removal from the public sphere, which is the dangerous sphere for uh, contraband and vice that evokes and interactions on the street that evoke violence. Until today, the latest figures I saw 
there were 17,000 homicides in the U.S., I think in 2017, and 70,000 overdose deaths. And while the crime rate from the 60s went up and down, the rate of death from overdose just is a continuous increase. New forms of drugs, new distribution, cheaper access, and this isn't death in public. This is death in private. So we basically transfer it. So the, this is not the sort of explanation you typically are going to hear out of criminology. They think that there's a set group of people who are prone to do the crimes, and they've gotten the message uh, in a different way, so they're acting differently. Uh, so I will summarize um, turning points, the, a missing kind of link in criminological theory. Here are different kinds of turning points that happen. Um, the disreputable poor. David Matza, studying the Lower East Side in New York, the turn of the 20th century from the 1880s to about 1920, one immigrant group after the other was the top crime group. Whether it went from uh, Scottish to Polish to Jewish to Irish to Puerto Rican, the Lower East Side remained a very high crime area as the ethnicities changed. And his phrase for why, what was particularly aggravating was that all these groups, the, the change of groups indicates mobility. They're moving out. The same buildings that were occupied by the Scotch are now occupied by Poles, are now occupied by Irish, are now occupied by Jews from the Pale of Russia, are now occupied by Puerto Ricans. Where are they going? Well, they're going to better housing. The ones who remain are the disreputable poor. Being poor uh, is not as shameful a matter when everybody in your group is poor. But the more people who leave and succeed, the more personal shameful implication you can anticipate others will see from your remaining poor of that group. If you're the last you know, if you're the last Irish in an area that's now almost completely Puerto Rican, that says something different about you than if you're Irish with other poor Irish. So this is one of the turning points that's common, that's repeated in American urban history. It gets worse before it gets better, or it gets worse as it's getting better, just because it's getting better, just because the group is moving out. Those who remain are even more either selected for problems because they can't organize, they have whatever disabilities, whatever bad luck, they don't get out, and or it's more humiliating for them, one of the turning points. Another turning point is the immigrants. Immigrants from early on, from the first sociology studies in the US in Chicago, Polish peasants, are they very vulnerable? They're vulnerable to getting exploited by others and including vulnerable by other wise guys of their own group. That is to say, immigrants of their own group who think they're more hip and take advantage of other immigrants as, as less immigrant. As the immigration population gets more time, they get wiser. So you get a turning point there. Immigration turns from being a crime producer to being a crime reducer of the same group. And then you get turning points that are created through what I call folk sociology. And I'll give you an example from a park. I spent a day with a, a student in a summer program, and she was uh, an African-American woman who had friends in a house near a park. And so we're sitting in the car, we're watching, and at one time a day, everybody in the park is African-American. And then we stay there, we watch later, and we turn up after discussion, and everybody's Hispanic. There's no African Americans in the park. And then later on in the day, they're all African American. 
So as we're talking about this, what happens is they are doing folk sociology. That is to say, the different people around that park are just trying to understand who's going to be here. What kind of atmosphere is it going to be? Is this a place for me or not? And the turning point in the daily cycle is a kind of synodoki for the turning point historically. That is to say, what happens over time is the Hispanic population builds up to such a point that they can anticipate they're going to be the dominant group in the park. And so parks, which had been a locus for gang hangouts and violence, they get transformed one after the other. And uh, a larger kind of folk sociology turning point is what's called the return of the city. That is to say, land values in the close-in cities start to mount. And I believe they've mounted everywhere in the US, pretty much in all cities. And I understand something similar has happened in Western Europe, that it gets increasingly pricey. In Amst I just came out of Amsterdam, and the same call that you hear in the States, that the Amsterdammers will no longer be able to live here, because all these people are coming in to bid up. Uh, so this is a cry. Well, what happened? What, after the Second World War, as the highways are built, the populations are being uh, getting access through the highways and automobiles to what had been cheap land, and there's new housing construction, and it's, more, it's relatively more attractive to a lot of people to locate outside than inside, and for businesses as well. And after a certain point, the land values parallel the land values in the close-in city, and it's not that everybody's deciding I'm going to live in the close-in city, it's that there's no longer the attraction, the special value you'll get, or there's less of an attraction of moving out. Now, when does this happen? It doesn't happen when the curves cross of the, the value in the close-in city and the value in the suburbs or exurbs. It happens when people looking at the phenomenon and trying to figure out not just what will it be like tomorrow when I move to this place, but what will it be like in a year? And if I'm buying a house in five years, and if I'm locating a business in several years, everybody's doing folk sociology, trying to do urban sociology and making their own decisions. And at some point, enough, initially, when land values are going down in the city, some people are seeing opportunity and they're coming in, but enough of them have to build up so the message starts to go out and all of a sudden there's a turning point. And, and everybody gets the message, you better get in now, because if you don't get in now, if you don't move there now, in the future it'll be too expensive. So turning points are typical in land economics and the, and the fluctuations of land economics around cities. And that comes in after crime has gone down substantially as another layer of pressures because you have more affluent people coming in, more business activity, more surveillance, and so you get a kind of acceleration of the trend. So it's not the, the, the individual variables that criminal, criminologists tend to study, age and ethnicity and economic status. It's these more collective phenomena that change in kind of historical layering form. And so if I would have, have three suggestions for studying crime, particular uh, the rise and fall, but a variety of other crime problems, I would say in particular for the experiences we've had in the US, do it through urban sociology, look at areas of the city and not just crime decontextualized from the social geography. Second, look at circles of chaos and how they build and operate and then decline. Don't look at the individual crime rate, uh, acts themselves. And third, um, look at the, the folk sociology, which is, which is basically an attempt to, to solve the prisoner's dilemma that is part of all urban life. And that is, you know, if we all agree to do the same thing, we're all better off, but none of us will agree to do it unless we think everybody else will do it, because then we're worse off. So it starts out with, like, fire prevention. And, the, you know, Notre Dame just makes you realize how rare that is and how it is that only Notre Dame burned down and not all of Paris, because 100 years ago, a fire like that would have brought down the whole city. A fire like that brought down San Francisco completely. It's only been in the 20th century that we, and why is that? Because until there was a solution to the prisoner's dilemma, it made no sense for me to put up protection on my house or my business against fire if my neighbor wasn't going to, because the fire is gonna jump over. 
And if all the neighbors are on fire and I'm the one house in the middle and I've spent all this money in fire protection, it's not going to work. We need some sort of solution to the collective dilemma. And it, it took centuries for cities to do this, right? All the cities of the world burned down <coughs> repeatedly until basically the 20th century and the, put, and the implementation of fire codes and then aids to fire departments and taxation to support that. And in a sense, that's the problem of crime. Once people decide, the other people who are going to be in the park are going to be other people celebrating kids' birthdays with a birthday party and a piñata, and it, we, it's going to, they go in, and then the guys who would come in to hang out realize it's not their space anymore. But that kind of folk sociology, if, we, if they all agree to do it, and you still have a period where uh, more will happen because there's still a developing realization of the common interests that people have, but it takes a long time without government leadership for that to, to perk up. So the third suggestion is keep in mind the prisoner's dilemma, tragedies of the commons, all that kind of theorizing that's claimed by lots of different disciplines, doesn't really have one sole vocabulary that I think of, but that's really the organizational problem of cities that uh, that when they stop solving that problem, crime rises in pockets of chaos, and when they start solving it, they get control over it. And that's what I had to say. Thank you.